Thank you, Mary. Good afternoon. Can I find out? How many of my son's students are in this room right now? Ray, stand up. Come on, let me see. One, two, three. Do I have any more? Just three, because for those of you that are here, I will promise you. I'm Polish. You'd never know what the name is Smith. My mother's name was Kopecki. When she hit Ellis Island, there wasn't even a vowel in their last name. Ah, there I am. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. I really, I do want to start with a, a, a few thoughts. First of all, this program. Uh, I came here in 1975, right out of the industry. We had a restaurant in Chicago, and it was called Chateau Louise. I left coaching, and in a period of over 14 years, we became the eighth largest restaurant in the city of Chicago. I had only three catastrophes for you foodies. It was called breakfast. Lunch and dinner. <laughs> I, honest to God, I can tell you this, that I had three great days in my life for you foodies. Day we beat Michigan at Illinois where I played, when they let guys my size play. Uh, we lost to them three years in a row and then we beat them in 1950. The second day was the day I had a son after four daughters. Thank you, I need all the applause for that one I can get, man. I, I never thought it was gonna happen. And the third day was the day I fired my chef. <laughs> now, I'm, I, no, he, he, he you, you know this television show that they have on there, that Hell's Kitchen or something like that? Oh, is that, for, I'm serious, that's the worst show I think I've ever seen. <laughs> what a way to depict this industry. It really is, it is terrible. And at the end of the, the media has never been terribly kind to us when it comes to that anyway, but in this case, it was too close to true. Uh, I was new to the business. He taught me that it was okay for the chef to drink in the kitchen. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And he and our bar manager had a real deal going. And I was taught this way until we, eventually I found my way around and I thought, we're not going to do this anymore, and stopped it. And he was gone, and, but I don't, to this day, I don't know how to cook. I really don't. I know how to hire people, and I know how to taste, and that really helps if you're in the business. Anyway, where I wanted to go today, and I, I, I'm an old guy. I, when you get to be my age, people, people want to carry out groceries in the grocery store for me. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Whatever. 
Don't you hate? Well, nobody in this room understands that. Wait till you get to be my age and somebody wants you to treat you like you're helpless. Hope, hopeless, maybe. But I have a different perspective. I have a perspective. You know, there are three basic fundamentals. I got this from the, a great book, The Velvet Monkey Wrench. But three basic fundamentals that we, we deal with, the teachers, the managers, we deal with in life. And, and, and they are, one, knowledge. The second one is understanding. And the third one is wisdom. Knowledge is what you get, for the most part, at the university. Understanding is going to happen now, when you begin to go out into the field and put together all of the things that you've learned. Like, where are you, Mary Dawson? Oh, there you are. <laughs> like menu engineering, right? That's right. I wrote the book. Learned it from the best. <laughs> but wisdom is something that is perhaps taking place now. I'm 80 years old. I know, say, it's hard to believe. I'm 80 years old. And I'm still pumping iron. Got a plate in my hip. I can't run anymore, but I can work the bike. And what I'd like one more time is just have one good street fight. <laughs> you know, isn't that stupid? But it's, God, one time. But today, you don't fight anymore. They shoot you. So I, <laughs> so you, you don't do that. I come from Chicago. I'm inner city. Uh, I go back to the old neighborhood, and you wouldn't want to walk in this place anymore. But I look back at when I didn't have any understanding. All I had was my mother, Stefania Kapecki, who ran my mother when she was 94 years old. When she wanted my idea, she gave them to me. <laughs> to this day, you want to know what these times we live in today, so tough. And I can still hear my mom saying, I am president of an international public company called Shakey's. It used to be called Steady's before I got there. But be that as may. <laughs> be that as it may, she would still ask me the famous questions, which some of you today are going to have to ask. Do they like you, Donald? Do they like you at work? Is your job fundamentally sound? We have lost, we have lost that attitude. And now I say we in a collective sense. You here are in a career day program. How different it was when I was in college. When I was in college, I wanted a coach. You got in your car and you drove every high school you could that one of your teachers or one of your coaches said, go there, there there's, there's an opportunity. You went there, they did not come to you. And today, look at you. Look at these people in this room, you young people. They're here, they're here for you. And as some of you know in the room, I walked around today asking you, what it was you were looking for. And I share this with our young people right now. Do you know what they're looking for? Number one, I heard it over and over again in different ways. It was passion. A passion for our business. I love this business. I don't want you to say, I am in this business because I love people. <laughs> Two months in the business, you will hate people. <laughs> now, when we hear, when John over there pins the badge on your graduation day and says, you are a graduate, you are a manager. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> Not because you like people. Because, well, let me tell you, you will prove it when you can be nice to people you hate. 
I walk the floor. Let me share with you, you, you wonderful people that are in here. And the kids in Dirk's class who are going to get a pizza, by the way. You're going to get a Chicago pizza, Pizzeria Uno, or one of those. He's going to have it invited just for you guys. Three of you, you're going to split a great pizza. <laughs> in any case, you're here today. And I've got a few words to say, hopefully. I'm, I'm a little, not a little, I'm a lot, concerned about where we are as a nation. And I want to share a book with you. In fact, I brought three books that I can just make my point with. Today, you'll hear people say, kids ain't what they used to be. And I'm sure a lot of teachers have said that. And I want to tell you that five years ago, when I quit at Washington State University, I want to tell you what my senior class did. My senior class met every third class at 6.27 a.m. Why? Because I said so. <laughs> oh, do I sound like your mother and father? Whoa! You do it because I said so. Now let me tell you. We would have a guest speaker that would give them two and a half hours John Martin at the, give you an example, John Martin was chairman of the board of Taco Bell. And when Taco Bell went into the value menu a few years ago and knocked the socks out of our industry, and eventually it was caught up because McDonald's finally had a deal with that 34 cent hamburger that they came out with, but what a war. And they taught you how to war. And he taught our kids, here he is at, John Martin, chairman of the board, Taco Bell, would say, let me tell you how we did it. Tell you about the research, how they tested the unit, how they went out and tested that price point. It was worth getting up at 6.27 AM. And I had president after president or marketing, wait, please, the guys that had the inside story. But also, what was 6.27 about? You recruiters, if you came to my class, you'd know you found committed kids. I, was an, I am a varsity coach. A varsity coach. I'm not interested in the intramurals. And I want players. And I'm looking for people that are committed. Well, if you're going to get up at 627 in the morning, damn well, you're committed. Love these kids. Love these kids. As they do you, Jim. Seriously. Uh, Steve, Barth, and you were mentioned to me today over and over again. Because one of my favorite questions to your students is to say, who's your favorite teacher? And <laughs> I asked you, right, who's your favorite teacher? And one of our favorite teachers, by the way, who's been absconded, you know, it's easy to, my classes are fun. I'm teaching marketing, I'm teaching management, all this soft stuff that you can't ever prove it works. <laughs> and the kids love my class, and it's fun, and we do all kinds of mysterious things. But there is, it is really unusual that we would lose maybe one of the greatest teachers I've ever, and I'm not saying this for her, but Agnes DeFranco taught the worst class I could ever take. <laughs> it was accounting. There isn't a kid in, my, in the school that likes accounting that's in this program. <laughs> and Beans. Don't you ever call her that. She was, when I would ask the question, who's the best teacher you had, so many would say Agnes DeFranco. So get out of that administration. There are a bunch of phonies. These are all politicians. If not, I'll get you fired, so don't worry. Kids aren't as good as they used to be. You recruiters, I don't say this is something that uh, our students necessarily have to read, but it would be good. It's difficult. You beat your way through this book. But what he's done, these two researchers have gone through, they're historians, they have gone through history and have gone back and identified four separate periods of every 80 years, broken down by 20 years. And the first one, and I'm giving it to you very straight. It's called the period of heroes. 
The period of heroes were born or are born during calamitous times. Calamitous times would have been the roaring 20s if you had gone back 80 years before this period. And then we have our period which started in 1940s. World War II. I grew up in the Depression. I never understood it. I wasn't, I, I was never a part of it. My mom and dad took care of us. And so, you know, we always ate. We had a house, a roof over our head. So it didn't mean a lot to my, at my age group. But they were scared stiff. 20% of the population, maybe more if you add it up, how you add it up, we're out of work. We're not far from that right now. If you take all the people that don't look for jobs anymore, the ones that are off the rolls, and then our own 9 or 10%. In the book, they point out that every 20 years, after the hero 20-year period, the children of the heroes, by the way, the heroes believe in institutions, God, the family, and the, as Vince Lombardi used to say, there's God, the family, and the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> and then he would say, and not necessarily in that order. But those people raised children like we did that would say to their kids, I don't, want to, I don't want you to work as hard as I had to work. I don't want you to go to college. And I want you to have better things. And it worked pretty well. But those kids have lost a little bit of the dogmatic approach that we had toward tradition, toward God, family, and the Green Bay Packers. And so they then, the fabric of our culture loosens, and they have children. And we had children that grew up in a time I, I can't understand, the drug culture. I never, I swear, I've never smoked, let alone take one of these marijuana cigarettes. I wouldn't, if I got any higher under my normal speed, where the hell would I go? <laughs> But I, I don't understand this period we live in. But the beauty of the book, it was written in 1994 or 5. And he said the third turning, the third level of what's coming is about to approach. And we will be in the fourth turning. And he says, or they say, and I'm not exaggerating, I got a chill to when I tell you. Between the years of 2006 and 2012, our country will come, to come apart again. And heroes will be born again. So we don't have to wait very long. Isn't it amazing when you read his, their time period and what they saw? We're facing it now. Now, the third, well, the second book, I, I just want you, if you walked out of here and said, I'm going to read that, it's worth it, and particularly the recruiters. And I'm not against these students reading it. My second book up here is, that I brought for you is my favorite of all time. It's called The Road Less Traveled. Three things it talks about. There's three things that, that make life. And this is coming from wisdom now. This is not coming from knowledge. It does come from some understanding. But I've made my mistakes. Oh, God. You know, I've often wondered when, I'm, when I have a lot more time than I have right now, why students don't say, what, what did you do wrong, coach? What mistakes could I have learned? What did I do? Like when I was in college, not to learn to type. Oh, my God. I love the computer, and I can't type. But that was a girl's thing to go into a typing class. And I, my masculinity was so threatened to take a typing class. <laughs> I, I never had an accounting class for, oh my God, can you believe it? I never understood depreciation. <laughs> I made a mistake. I made a lot of them. Somehow, you make mistakes and you recover from them. Hear me, you, we, we will recover. We're going to recover from this problem. In 1969, at the Chateau Louise in Dundee, Illinois. All of a sudden, like somebody put a barricade over our road. The business went south. 
And instead of being up 7% to 8% annually, we were down 4%. Now I live by a, I live by a book, it's written every day, it's called the Beat Yesterday book. And the only thing that counts, the only thing that I measure every day is how many guests we served a year ago, same day, same time, same station. Same weather conditions. And compared it to what we're doing today. And I'd either be happy or I'd be sad. And as soon as one day, mind you, that we fell behind our guest count from the year before, my hands would sweat. I owed $28,000 a month. Debt service, it's called. Debt service. So when you go to work for a hotel industry, in the hotel industry, understand why the guys at the very top, their hands are perspired. You, they don't want you to know that their debt, debt service monthly is perhaps millions. That's their worry. Your worry, your job, is to put heads in beds. And I used to say the. The greatest decor in the restaurant business, asses on chairs. <laughs> so that's what you do. Don't tell me when I'm a recruiter that you are in this business because you love people. <laughs> what I want you to be able to say, and some of you have the experience already, you know how to do it. A, I can smile at the worst of them. I can solve that problem with that guest. I know how to listen. I know how. And by the way, I'm not a fool. There are times you have to throw somebody out. There really are times when you've got to toss them out. Very difficult to do, by the way, and you've got to do it very carefully. Never argue with a drunk. That's wisdom. <laughs> Just keep moving that drunk. Slowly, slowly out the door. Where that, you don't have to touch them, but just keep doing what you want them to do, but always agree that Yes, you're right. And so I want you to say to your recruiter, I can put those hind ends in chairs for you. The greatest compliment any of and I know there are unit managers here. Where's my outback guys and are they in here? Uh, I know there are unit operators here. I want you to be able to say that I can, when people come in and ask for me as a server, for example, that's one of the greatest compliments a server can ever have. Now let me ask you, how many times has someone ever said, I want you to know that that person is absolutely incredible and I'll be back for that waiter or waitress and that waiter or waitress never hears from the boss? That's criminal. And there are a lot of monsters out there. There are a lot of guys that are managing restaurants and hotels that are literally brutes. Your job is to put up with it, get by them, get by them, learn everything you can. The worst boss I ever had taught me more than maybe anybody I've ever worked for. I look back as a kid, my mother I mentioned, you know, you can never, have, never satisfy her. Then there was Sister Equinata. Oh man, I still got my knuckles from Sister Equinata. She, Beat the daylights out of us. And you, you walk, you, you walk, this is Dominicans. If you're not Catholic, you don't know, but they have a dark habit. And the only thing that is light on them is a little piece of a white thing on their head. And if they hide in the corner, you don't see them. <laughs> and I, I swear, I mean, I'd be coming, you, am I kidding? Man, they are in disguise. <laughs> and they just pop out of a corner because you're happy. And what? Right over the top of the head. Don't be happy. I'm not happy. You can't be happy. <laughs> the road less traveled. Let me get to that. The road less traveled is the most important thing in success in life. I will place it, and he does too, called discipline. Called discipline. Every five or six years, as my Christmas cards will say, I will have given up alcohol altogether. I will just say, I'm not going to have a drink this entire year. And I do it. Not because I think I'm having a problem with alcohol. I, have, I usually have a drink a day. Doctor says it's good for me. 
but because I want to know that I can still do it. I still do my exercises every morning, and my wife thinks I like those exercises. I hate those exercises. <laughs> oh, you know, the first thing I ask is, do you exercise? And she says, no, look at her, look at her. I won't tell you how old she is. But Agnes doesn't exercise. <laughs> What's wrong with that? I, okay, okay. In any case, you've got discipline. What do they tell you? You're going to work. Figure it, you don't know anything. You're going to work for someone in this room. You're going to be a sponge. You have knowledge. You don't have understanding. You will get understanding here. And after you've done here, a number of years you will have wisdom. And some of you in here want to own your own whatever. Probably in the food service business because it's really hard to get into the hotel business. It's just damned expensive, that's all. Go to work for the toughest, meanest, most successful restaurateur that there is. Do everything they say. In five years, seven years, eight years later, maybe you'll be ready to try your own wings. Great opportunity, entrepreneurs. Great opportunity for entrepreneurs. Never before has it been any good, certainly in the last 50 years. Why? Because chains have taken over the world, and chains eventually forget that they're there to serve the customer, and chains are there to serve the stock market. And they start changing their rules to serve the stock market, and that opens the door for another restaurateur to come in who still focuses, focus, focus, focus on the customers. But discipline in the second part of the book, they talk about love. And I must tell you, I, I've never read anything quite as profound. When my graduates write me and tell me they're getting married, every time they do that, I send them the book. And then I put the, put the paper clip on the piece on love. And I will not go any further than to tell you this. And by the way, I have been married to the same lady. We're going on 60 years now. <laughs> I appreciate your applause, but it really is for my wife. <laughs> you, know what, you know what Vince Lombardi said when you want to know, what's it going to take to be a successful coach? He said a five-year contract and a spouse that puts up with a whole lot of neglect. And boy, do I have a spouse that puts up with a whole, put up with all my shenanigans. At any rate, the only thing I'll leave you on the love thing is this. And it's something to think about because most of you see, it's a different time. I was 21 years old and I got married. You think, what did that do in our age group? Most of my friends were 20, 21, 22 and we got married. Immediately we had children and those children forced us to work. <laughs> there was no way out, we had to work. And we had one child, we had two, three, four. I finally found out what caused it and I stopped it. <laughs> But we had five kids, and man, I'll tell you what, do you work every job, every job that you possibly can. And every one of the people that are out there recruiting in this place that have that's been in this industry understands what I'm talking about. Get your expectations. Hey, you want to be the best there is. That's your expectation. And you will do anything, anything it takes to get you there. Show up before everyone else is there. Go up. Isn't that awful? That's what you have to do. Do you want to win? You want to be the best? Be the hardest working person there. I was the hardest working. We have a ranch. We have almost 200 acres. We got cows. I hate cows. But <laughs> we have cows. I got three cars. Well, one car and two, two trucks. And my life has never, never been what I thought it was. I never thought I could be where we are. And it was the restaurant business, the food service, and I had an inn, by the way. Small inn, 100 rooms. But this business gave it to us. This is one hell of a business. And that, that I, I want to move right on to the third book, but let me say what he says in here is so profound. To understand true love, you must first fall out of love. You must fall out of the love that you thought was love 
being enamored with another human being who thought they were there and the whole world was, you were meld together. And then, to truly understand it, like I think I begin to have wisdom in that area. I'm still working on that one. I, I got some understanding. You can't understand women 100%, right? <laughs> but I tell you, you got to fall out of love, and then you have to work. Keeping a marriage, and particularly in our business, you want a rule? You want some discipline? I challenge you, and I swear to God, I'm not exempt. I did this because my teacher, Winchuler in Michigan, taught me this. Never take a drink in your own restaurant or your own hotel. Never take a drink in your own hotel. Can you do that? Hell yes, you can. Will most people do that? No. So easy to set yourself apart from the masses. And this is what I'm here for. It's for you. That's really what I'm about today. They're not paying me. They couldn't pay me enough to do this. <laughs> okay. The third part I'm not going to get into, but it's, it's discipline, it's love, and it's religion and grace. And while he, Scott Peck is a, a minister, he's also a full-fledged psychiatrist, and that's where he spends most of his time in this. Now, the third book that I brought today is something you guys have been raised on. Words. People get in your heads. They get in your heads and you hear things like, don't work so hard. You're going to kill yourself. <laughs> how many of you have ever, how many of you in this room have had anybody ever tell you, don't work so hard, you're going to kill yourself? Would you please stand up? Stand up, come on, stand up. I want you to stand up, please, please. All right, come on, if you heard those words, stand up. Now you recruiters, look around. You are, this is, a, this is better than any test I could give you. Find them, sign them up, get their names, get their names. Okay, you can sit down. And you're only a sophomore. You've heard, what's the other one? Well, don't work so hard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Work smart. Don't work hard. What a moron's perspective. <laughs> Any of you believe that? It's crap. That guy's trying to get you fired right off the bat. And the book I got here. Man, the book says don't sweat the small stuff. You hear me? Don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> Here, you can have it. Our business is small stuff. You walk through that restaurant, you open your door, you go to beat yesterday book, you see what you did last night, you're not going to be happy, you're not going to be not happy. You're going to see what you're going to have to do. If it's starting to run a period of time that you're doing this, you're in trouble. Then after that, you walk through the restaurant. You say hello to everybody or the hotel. You call everybody by name. You remember their names, you look them in the eye, and you say, how are you? You remember their kid's name, something like this, and you let them know. That way you let them know they're important. Don't tell me that... You want to make them feel important. When somebody says, I want to make them feel important, that is such a down remark. They are important. You don't want to make them feel important. You can ignore them. You go by any employee and don't have eye cont contact with them. You can't imagine what you're sending, what message you're just putting in their mind. And you've all worked for people like this. They're the brutes in our industry. Don't you be one of them. It's from all stuff. Have you heard about walking into your restaurant and not hearing the sound system on? You restaurant operators in here have had that experience. And, and the first thing you want to say is, doesn't anybody hear there's no music? <laughs> you see, that's part of what we do as managers. We go through and everything else is perfect, but we find the one thing that's not working. The other one is this. It's freezing in here. That's good. It's freezing in here. Waiters and waiters don't like it. If you let them at the thermostat, they will turn the heat up. 
and then once you get a customer group in your restaurant, it builds the heat up, you cannot recover. That's wisdom. <laughs> That's wisdom. You're not going to learn that. You're going to learn that on the job. These are the, there's thousands of little things that I've been taught and made mistakes. So sweat the small stuff. It is the small stuff. It's not having an iced tea filled up to, to the top of the brim. It's the little stuff. Now, you, if you want the ranch someday, and I'm, hey, I'm enjoying life, man. Uh, my kids, my students used to say, don't you miss it? Are you kidding? Oh my God, I'm too old. I'm too old for this job. It is, this is a, be ready to get out at 45. <laughs> Get out at 45, become a manager. I'm, I don't mean a unit manager, an area manager, district manager, whatever they call them. And I think, Mary, how much time did you give me? As long as, you need. As, long as I need. And then she says, but I can't talk about Obama. <laughs> ah, she did. I know I'm teasing. <laughs> No, I'm tired. Uh, you know, I had a, uh, there are two things I want to do. I, I, I won't bore you with this, but I got the list of names here of kids that I have kept contact with that go all the way back when I started teaching here. I want to tell you, I'll tell you one story. It's a good story. I have a class called 461. Do we still have 461? It was a market. You don't know. What the hell? You're only the dean. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you want to know something, ask Mary. No. Where is Shaw? Is Shaw in here? Donna Shaw? Where are you? She left in my talk? Oh. Ask Kirk, Donna knows everything. I want to tell you about this kid. I had two kids in my first marketing class. And I assigned, my first project was, I want you to go to a restaurant over here on Richmond Avenue, not very far from us. It had opened, it was 1975. This little restaurant had opened up in a uh, redone flower shop, a little old green flower shop on Richmond Avenue. And as people were standing in line waiting to get in this restaurant, and if you would have walked or taken your car down Richmond Avenue, there were no lines outside of any other restaurant. And I'm not exaggerating. And my question was, I want you to go give me a report, no more than two pages, I, I gotta live a life of some kind, so two pages will do, and I want you to tell me why you think they're standing in line. What I was really looking for was the marketing mix. I wanted the kids to begin to think of the pieces that made the constellation of, of a food service business or any business. And so there were two kids in the class that I will never forget. They wrote a good report. They were two bartenders, by the way. I swear these guys, I, these guys were going to amount to no good. But anyway, I liked them because they showed up every day. So they went to the coffee shop and they gave me, the, the restaurant rather, and they gave me a report. And it was good. And then I hear that this little coffee shop, or this little restaurant rather, not coffee shop, uh, was expanding. The name of that restaurant was Chili's. It was Chili's second unit. The name of one of those two boys was Doug Brooks, who graduated here, who is today chairman of the board. And I get chills thinking about that kid and his partner, Kenny Dennis, who just passed away, later on was chairman, or was president of one of Doug's companies. Uh, it was called uh, On the Border. This is, the, this is why teaching, I swear to you, I love teaching and coaching. Teaching has a disadvantage 
compared to coaching because I, we could work like hell all week long and on Friday night know whether or not we did our job. But you don't know when you're teaching whether or not you've done your job until many years later. And I could go through this list with the people that, geez, Ken Dennis, Charles Dorn, Charlie Dorn, what a pain in the butt. <laughs> Charlie Dorn is one of the most successful club managers, guys, God, he was a leader here. He was the head of Lake Gourmet when we were here. Jeez, Ger Gerard Case, Johnny Case's kid, still running that business over there. Oh, I could go on. One more, one more. There was a, a, a lady in my class by the name of Nina. And one day she said to me, my husband's with, with steak and ale. Could I bring him to class? And it just so happened on that day, we were talking about one of my, we had four concepts under one roof at, at Chateau Louise. One of the concepts was a steak by the ounce restaurant. And it just so happened on that day, Nina brought her husband to class. He was a steak and ale and a really good operator. About three years later, they call and say, Coach, we're interested in opening a restaurant. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm always leery. You know, if somebody wants to open a restaurant, I'm, whoa, 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 are you sure? They said, yeah, we're going to call it the Taste of Texas. Those kids took the bait. My wife and I went out when they were putting it together, showing them how we used uh, our control, the, the, the steaks, on the, so the customer got the right steak and all that sort of stuff. Those kids now have the highest sales restaurant in the city of Houston. They're used, they're guys like you in this class. They were, I wouldn't have thought more about Nina or Doug Brooks or Kenny Dennis or any of these kids or Rabbi Ralston or any of these kids any more than I think of you. Somebody in this room and hopefully many of you in this room someday are going to be listed among them and I hope I'm around to put them on my list. And that's, that's where I end with just a little letter. I want to re read this letter to you. Some of you have heard this before. This is hooked up there, Edward. Yeah, I have enough trouble reading it as it is. This is a letter I got from one of my students. Dear mother and dad, since I left for college, I've been remiss in writing, and I'm sorry for my thoughtlessness in not having written before. I'm going to bring you up to date now, but before I read any further, please sit down. You are not to read any further unless you're sitting, okay? <laughs> well then, I'm getting along pretty well now. The skull fracture and the concussion I got when I jumped out of my window at the dormitory is when it caught fire is short after my arrival, it's pretty well healed now. I only spent two weeks in the hospital and I can almost see normally <laughs> and only get those sick headaches once a day. Fortunately, the fire in the dormitory and my jump was witnessed by an attendant at the gas station near the dorm. And he was the one who called the fire department and the ambulance. He also visited me in the hospital since I had nowhere to live because of the burnout dorm. Uh, he was kind enough to invite me to share his apartment with him. It's really a basement room. It's, it's kind of cute. <laughs> He's a very fine boy, and, and we've fallen deeply in love. And we're planning to get married. And we haven't set the exact date yet, but it will be before my pregnancy shows. <laughs> uh, yes, mother and dad, I'm pregnant. I know how much you are looking forward to being grandparents, and I know you will welcome the baby and give it the same love and devotion, tender care that you gave me when I was a child. The reason for the delay in our marriage is that my boyfriend has a minor infection which prevents us from passing our premarital blood tests and I carelessly caught it from him. I know that you will welcome him into our family with open arms. He is kind and although not well educated, he's ambitious. Although he is of a different race and religion of ours, <laughs> I hear somebody, oh my God. <laughs> 
I know you've often expressed tolerance and will not permit that to bother you. Last paragraph. Now that I brought you up to date, I want to tell you that there was no dormitory fire. I did not have a concussion or a skull fracture. I was not in the hospital. I am not pregnant. I am not engaged. I am not infected and there is no boyfriend. However, I am getting a D in American history and an F in chemistry. <laughs> want you to see those marks in their proper perspective <laughs> and I hope you see my remarks in their proper perspective I love the school it's got the best back door I've been at three major universities it has the best back door by back door place to get real experience understanding better than well, I won't name the others <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be here thank you Mary thank you John Thank you for showing up, Agnes. God bless you. Get back over here. Mary Dawson, I haven't invited the teacher uh, in your class for quite a while. What's the matter with you? <laughs> all you guys, Jim and Steve and all of you, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.